Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome back Frederick Scholzla uh, back to MSR. He he's a grad student in MIT. He's working with Saman uh, Amar Singha, and he's working. He's in the field of compiler and compiler optimizations and uh, high performance computing. And uh, he has been working on um, linear algebra for dense and sparse. Uh, inputs, and he's going to talk about his uh, recent compiler, which is a which is about uh, tensor tensor optimization. Thanks, uh, Said. Uh, so uh, last year, uh, about a year ago, I came to talk about a programming language we have called Semet, uh, which is for computing on graphs or sparse systems using linear algebra. Uh, and as part of the future work, I talked about uh, the need for like a strong compiler for compiling sparse linear algebra and tensor algebra, where, especially when the the matrices and uh, vectors are, are, are blocked. Uh, and I'm back today to talk about that work. So we've done it in the last year. Uh, and we also made it work for tensor algebra, so it generalized to tensor algebra as well, which is really neat. And it's dense and sparse tensor algebra. Uh, so um, we implemented this theory in a compiler. So I'm going to present a theory. I'm implementing a compiler called the tensor algebra compiler, which we abbreviate to TACO. Um, and this is joint work with uh, Stephen Chow and Samana Marashinge, who are both at MIT, and Shweb Camille, who's at Adobe, and then uh, David Lugato, who is uh, at the French uh, Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission. So um, uh, there's a lot of tensors around everywhere these days. Uh, you find them in data analytics, where you have uh, things like the Netflix movie ratings, or the Amazon uh, product reviews, or the social interactions of Facebook. And the, uh, a tensor is um, a generalization of a matrix to any number of dimensions. So a vector would be a zero tensor, a matrix would be a two tensor, and then you can have three tensors like these, or four tensors, and so on. You also find them in machine learning these days, uh, where both images and these, uh, these different inputs can be thought of as a tensor. Uh, or, and, but operations can also be a tensor, so a convolutional layer, applying that convolutional layer so it can be a tensor operation or applying a fully connected layer can be a dense tensor operation, or it can be a sparse tensor operation if you're talking about sparse neural networks. But you also find a lot of them in science and engineering. They, they made it possible, tensors made it possible for Einstein to do his general relativity, and they're used all over the place in quantum chromodynamics and uh, uh, quantum mechanics in general. Uh, and they're also used in other places. And here I have the finite element method. And the key there is that a lot of that is matrices. Sometimes you use tensors in these kind of structural mechanics. Uh, but uh, since we are talking about the generalizations of matrices, we also include linear algebra. So all I've been talking about applies to linear algebra as well. So we support that too. So uh, let's look at this Amazon product review tensor. So in the first dimension, this tensor has users. So different names of users, and there's many users. It's a huge tensor. Uh, then it, it's a three tensor, so it has a second dimension, and that would be products. So here's the different products the users bought. In the third dimension, you have the words in the product reviews. And if you do a, uh, so a prior work has shown that if you do a factorization of this tensor, you can learn something about what people are, are doing. This tensor is extremely sparse. Uh, it contains, uh, the whole tensor is uh, 15 quantillion zeros. And that's uh, enough that you need about 10% uh, of all the disk space in the world to store this tensor. But it only has 1.6 gigabyte, or about, uh, how many is it, uh, uh, 1.7 billion zeros. So not so many zeros, but for each zero, for each non-zero, I mean, sorry, 1.7 billion non-zeros. And for each non-zero, you have 10 billion zeros. So there's no way you can store this unless you compress it. So, so you have to take advantage of this sparsity. Uh, we, we have this kind of extreme sparsity is quite common in data analytics and science and engineering. It's all over the place. We're starting to see some work on sparse neural networks, but you have some sparsity. They haven't gotten to this level of sparsity yet, but perhaps they should, because the human brain has about 100 billion neurons, and each neuron is only connected to about 7,000 other neurons. That is an extremely sparse system. So if you can model something like that, we would have this, this kind of sparsity. So uh, one question is why we need a tensor algebra compiler. And I'm going to argue that we do need a tensor algebra compiler. 
So if you consider uh, uh, handwriting these different expressions that you would need in a, if you're working with linear algebra or tensor algebra, uh, you have to, the, the current approach with traditional libraries to hand code them. So this is a very simple expression. It's matrix vector multiplication. It's sparse matrix vector multiplication. So this B right there is sparse. Uh, the Eigen library implemented this, this operation. They hand coded it. Then the C sparse library implemented a different kernel that in one kernel multiplies B by C and then it adds it, accumulates it into the output. And they implemented this kernel because sometimes you get better performance by doing the whole operation at one go. When you talk about sparsity, just specifically the metrics is sparse, you're in not the case, vectors. Yeah. Yeah, that'll come. It'll be sparse too. Okay. But right now it's only the matrix that's okay. sparse. That's correct. Um, so there's two different kernels people hand called it. Then you have Petsy that figured out that you can add a different vector to result. OSCII figured out that uh, sometimes you can get better performance if you also scale both sides. Then the Petsy learned that you, you can also, on the fly, transpose this matrix. And then sometimes you want to transpose the matrix and want to add a vector. So someone wrote all these kernels because in different contexts, these different kernels give the best performance. So, so binary expressions are not enough because you lose performance due to the temporal locality uh, loss. But then you have different sparse formats for the matrix. These sparse formats can be blocked. They can be variable size blocked if you're dealing with something like uh, generalized coordinates. And it can also be doubly compressed. And now you have 132 different variants of this operation that someone has to go and hand code. Then the vector can be dense or sparse, which adds more, more variants. Both the output and the input and this thing you're plussing to can be sparse. And then you have the rest of the tensor algebra expression. And there's an infinite number of them. And even if you uh, only consider the binary operations, since the tensor can be any order, you have an infinite number of binary operations too. But I'll, I'll show this very clearly later, that if you only consider binary operations, you're losing a lot of performance. You're losing sometimes asymptotically performance. So. Uh, we have a tensor algebra compiler called Taco. Uh, the alternative to such a compiler is a traditional library where you hand code these kernels. With that kind of approach, you have to choose a few expressions judiciously. So you choose the most important ones. With the algebra compiler, you get any expression. You choose a few format with a traditional library that you want to implement, typically CSR and CSC, probably both. Uh, with the tensor algebra compiler, you get many formats. Uh, with a traditional approach, you spend years hand optimizing these kernels, and this guy has spent many years. With the compiler, you can relax because the compiler will do it for you. And this cat has a compiler. <laughs> so, we're going to talk in the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about sparse code and data to get a sense for sparsity and how the code looks like when it's sparse. Then, we're going to talk about the intermediate representations and the code generation that we do to automate this code, uh, generating these codes. Then, we're going to evaluate. But first, let's look at some sparse code and data. So this is a fairly simple tensor algebra expression. You have a tensor, B, that you're multiplying by a vector, K. So you're summing over this dimension. So it's like a matrix vector multiplication with one more dimension. And the result is a matrix. So those variables are called summation variables because you sum over it. That's K. I and J are called free variables because you, uh, you don't sum over them. So they are used on the left-hand side of this expression. So if all of these three tensors are dense, so you have a dense uh, matrix, a dense tree tensor, and a dense vector, then the code is quite straightforward. We can write this code easily. You have three nested loops, and you do the accumulation and multiplication in the center of these three loops. But if you want to start making uh, these uh, operands sparse, so in our system, you can choose whether a tensor is sparse per dimension. So for each dimension, you say this dimension is sparse or this dimension is dense. That gives you many combinations of formats. Like there's, um, I think, 16 combinations for this and eight combinations for that. So if I make that dimension, I dimension of the, this, the three tensors sparse, so I make it sparse, then the code changes a little bit there. So instead of uh, iterating over the whole domain, it iterates only over the data structure, the sparse data structure in that dimension of B. If I make the next dimension sparse, it changes the same way. If I make the third dimension sparse, it changes the same way. But if I want to make this vector sparse, then I have to insert quite a bit of code to merge together 
this vector, this sparse vector, with that sparse tensor in the k dimension. So that looks very similar to uh, like a merge join in databases if you're doing like a inner join. And if you had a uh, summation, it looked a lot like a two-way merge that uh, Donald Knoss will describe in his book on the art of computer programming. That's used in merge sort and it's used in merge joins in databases. We generate this kind of code and we can generate much more general code than this and I'll show that. But suppose uh, what you wanted to do, you had two sparse tensors, you want to add them, you want to multiply it by a vector in the same kernel. Then the code starts to blow up and you can't write this code anymore because there's all these cases you have to consider. And I'll show quite, quite a straightforward theory for how to generate these cases. So, I have a question about when you say a dimension is sparse, yeah. does the order matter here? Like the order Absolutely. of dimensions that you're talking about? Yeah, I left that out. You have to specify both whether each dimension is dense or sparse, and which order to store them. For example, for your cancer, if the first dimension is sparse, it means that <clears throat> the entire, like let's say, matrix is, is gone. If you say like something is missing from the second dimension, it means like the row is gone. Yeah. And then you feel, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, well, if I, yeah, exactly, exactly what you said. If this first dimension is dense, like this whole slice just disappears. Okay. Okay. And then that goes down. In our system, you not only specify this, you also specify the order you store the dimensions in. So if it's a matrix, you can store it in column order, which is CSC, compressed sparse column, or row order, which is compressed sparse row. So you can specify both things. I just left that out for simplicity. Okay, so let's look at, so that, that's how spot. Sir? I'm curious. Uh, so obviously this, you know, as a problem has existed for many years, right? And you know, people have worked on so what is it that's different now that, you know, why people in the you know, 90s were working on Fortran and, you know, trying to do, I don't know, the same kind of, uh, I mean, I, I'm just curious, you know, what, what, how has the problem changed, you know, over the course of the last decade? I don't think the problem has changed. I think just we found like a new attack angle on it. Uh, a lot of people worked on the dense problems, uh, like the polyhedron model and things like that, and they made a lot of progress there. Some people, like uh, Ber the Bernoulli work from uh, Kesha Pingali, uh -huh. and some work from uh, people in, uh, in Amsterdam tried to tackle this sparse problem. But they got stuck. Uh, I don't know exactly why they didn't solve the problem. Uh, I think they got stuck in the complexity of, uh, of the, they only did it for linear algebra. So I think maybe that was a problem, because if you only do it for linear algebra, you don't see the generality. Yes. You have to go to higher dimensions to see the generality, just like a human thing. Okay, I see. Uh, I think they got stuck in the complexity of the whole problem. What we figured out how to do is how to generate this kind of code level by level. So we do it for one dimension at a time. And then you can solve the problem locally in that dimension. Uh, and then it's a manageable problem. You still have to deal with the merging, but we, we've solved that too. Uh, I think they tried to do, solve it for, generate code for the whole thing in, at once. I see, and they just ran into complexity. It was yeah. too complex. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think maybe what changed about the problem is that. Uh, uh, we thought about it as tensors, and then you, uh, because it's uh, more generalized, you see the generality you better. Start with a more general sort yeah. of representation. Yeah. Yeah. We actually started first just with linear algebra, and uh, the theory got simpler when we generalized the tensors, huh. which is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. The the most related prior work is Kesha Pingali's Bernoulli work from the 90s. He was at Cornell at the time. So, so that was the, the sparse and dense code. And now we're going to look at the sparse and dense data. So this is the same three tensor, but I've unrolled it. So the three matrix slices are, are shown here. So if this is a dense format, I lay it out in memory linearly. And notice that these coordinates form a complete tree. And that is important, because since they form a complete tree, I can lo locate an element. I have random access. I can locate an element by just computing this formula, which is just a strided formula. Then I get straight down to the, the, the element. So I have random access. It's an important property. But I waste a lot of data because all these are empty. I don't want to store them. So I want a compressed storage format. What I do, I remove all the uh, zeros. I shove all these non-zeros next to each other. And now I don't have a complete tree anymore. So these can't be kept implicitly. I have to store these indices. So I start by storing the first indices in the i dimension. Then I store the indices in the j dimension. Then I store for each i, which j's correspond to that i. Then I store the case. Then for each j, i, j combination, which k's correspond to that. 
and that gives me a, quite a general format. So the compressed partial row format for matrices has one of these sets of indices. Um, if it was a doubly compressed partial row, you would have two sets. In tensors, you just keep going and you add one and one and one on top of it. This is sometimes called a compressed sparse fiber format. We can generate code for this and we can generate code with some of them and dance as well, so any combination. And then you have for each of these just which value it corresponds to. That's just by position. So you don't have random access, so you lost that. But typically when you compute, you can, uh, if you merge things together, you don't need random access. You just scan over the whole format. So I'll show that. So if you want to locate a value with uh, like the same value as we located earlier, then you have to scan across that row. You have to consider all the values on that row. You scan across the j's until you find j0. You consider all the k's for that j0, and then you scan the k's until you find it. You don't, so you lose sort of, you lose random access. You can do this, but it's expensive. And what this format does is that it creates this dependency chain through your index variables. And those index variables are going to correspond to your loops. So now you have dependency in your loops. And this, uh, this is a key observation. And we call this an iteration graph. And I will show how it works in general. So now I'm going to go into intermediate representation and code generation, which is our compiler. This is our compiler. So we call it TACO. That's an acronym for Tensor Algebra Compiler. Uh, the way it works is that it takes in a tensor expression any tensor expression, it can be any number of operands. And for each operand, you have to say the format of that operand. That's all you say. Then it produces C code, it produces a kernel that computes that expression on those formats. We also have a library so you can load data and all of those things as well. Internally, it turns your expression into an iteration graph. Then from the iteration graph, it produces code. And when it produces code, it uses this concept we call a merge lattice. That's a new concept we've developed to deal with these arbitrary mergers. Because you don't won't only want to deal with the binary mergers, you want to deal with like merging three operands, four operands, and any number of operands. Um, so, um, uh, let's see, so um, we're going to look at how the iteration space looks, and we're going to build up to this iteration graph and see where the iteration graph comes from. So it comes from these formats, but it also comes from your expression. So um, if you want to compute this expression, you have to iterate over all the combinations of i, j, and k. So it's going to be three loops, and you iterate over all that whole expression. So you can think of that as three dimensions in a polyhedron. So now we're moving towards the polyhedral model. At each location in this polyhedron, you're going to access b. So you're accessing b through this polyhedron. So it's a, it's a three-dimensional rectang rectangle here. But then you have to access k as well. And since k is only one dimensional, uh, it's only one of these, but you're going to access this for each ij. So you can think of it as replicating this, uh, this c across the whole iteration space. Then when you do the computation, you have to merge these together and compute the multiplication. So this is the polyhedral model. Uh, that at the heart of it, you have these affine <coughs> polyhedrons like this, but they have no holes. Like they're the dense polyhedrons. And the compiler community has spent many years like, figuring out how to compile stuff like this. And we've uh, made a lot, had a lot of success uh, with that in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Uh, but applications have been moving towards sparse representations, and the compiler community has to catch up to that. We have to give them some support. And we can think of this in a sparse way as polyhedrons with hole. So now we have a sparse polyhedron. And this uh, creates some opportunities and some problems that we have to solve. We don't know where these holes are at compile time. And, but, and we cannot touch these holes because I mentioned that Amazon Tensor, if you touch these holes, you, you, you will never finish. So you have to generate code that avoids touching the holes, but that can compute the values where you have non-zeros. So I put back this, uh, this dependency chain through the iteration variables that corresponds to this tensor. I'm going to have a similar dependency chain for the k, for the, c, for the c vector. So there's dependency chain here and dependency cha chain on the b vector. When I merge them together, I merge these sparse polyhedrons. I also merge together these two iteration graphs. So now you have this dependency chain and you have a merge here. So this collision there. So if I want to do 
that multiplication have to intersect the two sparse polyhedrons and then compute the intersection. Uh, and that, that's this multiplication. Then finally, I'm going to add in A, which is the result. There's a dependency on the result too. So uh, what this iteration graph shows is the dependencies imposed by the sparse data structure. And we're going to use this one for code generation. Here's some, we can generate these iteration graphs for any expression. It's a general representation. And here's some examples from linear algebra and tensor algebra. So this goes from uh, the matrix vector multiplication all the way down to this is the MTTKRP that you use for factorizing tensors. Uh, this is a blocked matrix vector multiplication, which turns into a four tensor operation. In our representation, we just the blocked matrix is a four tensor. If it's more blocked, it's six, a six tensor, so forth. So let's look at this expression again. And now we're going to look at code generation. So we have the iteration graph. We generated that from, from the formats uh, and, and the expression. And we're going to generate code. So if the first dimension of B was dense, then it's very simple. We can generate a dense loop. So this gets back to what I was talking, to, uh, talking about a little earlier, which is we can generate code for each level separately. So this level, I can ignore everything down here. We have a recursive code generator algorithm that's just going to recurse on this and generate, uh, val uh, generate code for each level. The first, the first level, since B is dense, you can just emit this loop. Second level, if B was sparse, you can emit a sparse loop. The complexity comes, uh, uh, comes in when you have a merge. So you're merging a sparse B with a sparse C. So now you have to emit this merge code. Uh, and I'm, I'll talk about how to do that next. And then at the center, you have to emit a compute statement. So this merge is what we call a conjunctive merge. It's an intersection. You want to produce values in the output wherever both B in the third dimension and C has a value because the multiplication by, uh, by zero disappears. Uh, sure, so then you have a sparse vector, let's say, or yep. anything, uh, any dimension. Do you store them in order, like the yep. indices? So, because that is necessary for all of this computation, right? Yeah, good question. Yes, we do in this work. Okay. We have future work where we, uh, so we, in this work, we have the dense format for a dimension <laughs> and the sparse format. And the sparse is uh, essentially CSR, it's ordered. Because right. you cannot do this kind of merge without right. ordering. Right. But we're working on uh, uh, for, uh, new work mm -hmm. that instead of two formats per dimension will give you hundreds of formats per dimension. Mm -hmm. And there you can select the properties you want. If you have ordering, you can do this. If you don't have ordering, you might be res have to resort to sorting it on the fly or do something more similar to hash join right. or, or something like that. Uh, but that is, that is future work we're working on right now. We mostly, uh, mostly sorted that out. Here it's ordered. Mm -hmm. But if the vector was dense, if this vector was dense, we take advantage of that. And we iterate over this sparse format and then just random access this, mm -hmm. which looks a lot like a hash join from databases. So there we, we don't merge there. Yeah, so that's the conjunctive merge. So I'm going to look at the conjunctive merge in more detail and show how we can generate code for it. Then I'm going to show how to generate code for a disjunctive merge, which comes from an addition. And then I'm going to show some examples of how we can do that for any expression, any combination of additions and multiplications. So this is just an element-wise multiplication of two vectors. Because since we do this per dimension, we can consider the vectors. And uh, by solving the merge problem for vectors, we have solved it for the whole thing because we just do that recursively. So here's two vectors. You element-wise multiply them. You produce results wherever both have a non-zero. Here only one have a non-zero, so you have no result. Since they're sparse, we enumerate the indices. Then we remove the non-zeros. And since uh, this is not the full range, we have to store them. So we store them. Then we want to take an intersection of these and these. And the way we think about that is using this thing. So this is our merge, uh, this is one point in our merge lattice. So merge lattice on ordered lattice. This is saying that wherever, so it's saying two things. It's saying iterate or both B and C until one of them runs out of value. That's one of the, the pieces of the AND. And it's also saying at each point, produce a value if both B and C has a value at that point. When one of them runs out of value, you drop down to the bottom lattice point and you're done. So if B runs out of value, you're done. C runs out of value, you're also done because it's a conjunctive merge. 
so we can generate code for this lattice point by lattice point. There's only one lattice point in this case. So we can generate a loop that runs while both have values. Then in addition, there's a case saying if both have a value at that point, you emit a value. So let's look at how that works for this example. We start by uh, finding the positions of B and finding the position of C. So now we initialize them here. Then we consider whether either of them are out of values. C is out of values here, so they still have values. Then you take the min of B and C at that location. If both of have a value at that location, you produce an output value. Then you increment uh, both of them that, were that, you had, uh, that, you, uh, that you consumed. And then you keep going until one of them runs at a value at this point. Then this test will fail, and you're done. And that's it. Now for the disjunctive merge. That's an addition, addition here. So we have a disjunctive merge. So instead of taking the intersection, we have to take a union. Then it gets a little bit more involved. So let's look at the lattice. We could create a lattice point that has some or. You iterate uh, 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 while one of them still have values left. And then if one of them have a value, you have to add a value to output because a plus zero is a. But this is too expensive to emit a loop like that. So we rewrite that expression to this form, which is a disjunctive sequence of conjunctions. So this is the two-way merge algorithm described in, Donald, uh, described in Donald Knuth's book. Then we put these two points, these two uh, terms, down in this lattice structure. So what this is saying, run while both of them have values left. If one of them run out of value, run out the rest of the other one and add it in. So to produce code for this, we produce one, code, one piece of one loop per lattice point. So the first loop runs while both have values. So it runs down here, same as in the previous example. Then, the, uh, then we are out of values in C. So we drop down the C edge here. And then we have to run out the rest of the values of B. So we emit a loop for that. Yes? So what about the order? The order? Like the you, you're disrespecting the order of the indices now, right? Because if, if you do the intersection first, then the, the ones that intersect first come first in oh. your storage, right? Oh, no, this is running. This is running down here, but we're going to make cases so that we can do all of the cases in the middle here. So you run down like this mm -hmm. until here, but you're going to emit values both where both have a value. Yeah, you're going to patch up. That's why you have the blank space. You're going to yeah. patch it up with the ones where you only have one. Right. I mean, there's there's going to be three cases yeah, yeah. here. One case where both have value, you yeah. add them. No, both yeah. Value, right? yeah. And those cases are also going to be generated from this lattice. Because there's one case per lattice point that's dominated by the lattice point you're currently emitting code for. And since these are dominated by only themselves, there's no cases because it's trivially just one case. So, so your code for B, uh, the, the lattice point B and C is different whether it's a disjunctive merge or a conjunctive merge. Uh, for, for this one? Yes. Yes, exactly. Because uh, right. It's a little misleading because before on the previous slide, it looked, if you ignore what's under it, it looked the same, but now it's actually the code's different. Yeah, the difference uh, comes from. Uh, okay, now I'm making a mess. The difference here is that you have only one case because you don't dominate all the things. So it's context sensitive, that's all. It is, uh, absolutely. Okay, I am making a mess. Okay, I think I saved myself. Okay, so you're at the B loop, and then you have to, that B loop will iterate until this one is out of values. And then you could have had a case where this one had more values, so you have to emit a loop for the C at this point too. And now we're getting to these cases. So there's going to be one case in this loop for every lattice point dominated by this. So since it dominates everything, there's going to be a case for everything. So the first case is if both have a value, you add them. Second case is if only B has a value, you store it. Third case is if only C, you store that. Uh, did that answer the question? Okay. So that was a disjunctive and a conjunctive merge. So, um, but, but as I said, we can do this for any expression. And I'm going to show you some examples. I'm not going to go in detail some though, but you're going to see some examples. So here I have an addition that's multiplied by a vector. So the lattice 
looks like this. And we have in, in our paper, in our upcoming Uppsala paper this year, we have uh, the algorithm for producing lattices from any expression. So as before, you just generate a loop for each lattice point. And in, inside each loop, you generate cases for each lattice point dominated. Here you're adding three uh, vectors together. So you're getting this rather large lattice structure. But as before, you just generate code for each lattice point. This, by the way, applies to databases too, because you can use this to generate code for, for uh, arbitrary joins. Then what if I make that D dense? Now you're going to get a mix of this merge code and this random access thing. So that turns out it's an optimization of this merge lattice where you knock out some of the points. Because the second you're done with D, you're done. Because it's dense, so it covers the whole space. So that just knocks out some of these loops and simplifies the other loops a little bit. OK, so we, we, we support any such thing where these can be dense or sparse. OK, so that was the. Cool. Also have cases uh, like maybe Boolean negation where zero becomes one and one becomes zero. So, you know, uh, like like a negation. That would just that wouldn't be a. You mean like <coughs> a, but you have to generate an output value yeah. where the input value is missing, but it's fast. Oh yeah, we haven't done that. For the, for most sparse operations, that would uh, be a problem. You, that would kill you pretty quickly. You we haven't. Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah, we haven't considered that case. Uh, I can imagine. Up, so it does show up in databases, but not I see. in the algebra. I see. Yeah, we haven't written the paper, like putting this into databases. Yeah, yet. but in machine learning, if you, if you do a Boolean negation, yes. So, we, uh, so Boolean negation is interesting because that's moving this to a different semi-ring than a normal semi-ring. I mean, we started thinking about it a little bit, but uh, apparently we haven't thought about it a lot. Uh, that would be very cool. I think then, um, oh, I can't. I have to think about it offline, how that would be done. But I'm sure we could figure out a way to generate that kind of code. You just have to run over. Maybe, maybe it's a, uh, what you do is that you generate all the values and then you run all the non-zeros and, and knock them out. Any other question for the compiler part? OK, then we're going to look at our evaluation. And the, the result is going to be that we're pretty fast. Uh, but before, I want to. <laughs> Have you ever seen an evaluation that doesn't say that? <laughs> but first, I'm going to show you guys a demo of Taco. So, so you're not tiling these loops? No, we're not. Say. For sparse <laughs> loops, you, you can. So tiling is like a two. There's two types of tiling. You can tile the data space, and you can tile the iteration space. And uh, you can use our formats to tile the data space. You can do that. Like I can turn. Uh, a sparse, sparse matrix into a sparse, 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 sparse for tensor, and I tile it that way. For tiling iteration space with sparse loops, uh, that doesn't buy you much because you have to have conditionals to figure out whether you hit the middle point of, of a row. Uh, for tiling them spaces, that makes a lot of sense because you have random access, so you can just run up to the middle and then jump down. Uh, but we haven't done that work yet. So when I said our results show we're we're fast. I mean, for sparse stuff. For dense stuff, we don't tile, so we're not going to be as fast as something like the tensor contraction engine from Ohio State. Uh, we, that's future work. We're going to look at it next semester, uh, this kind of tiling iteration spaces, so that we can be fast for dense operations as well. It seems I don't have um, access to the internet. Or you can just use my laptop. It's OK. I can. Uh, just do it with our, we have a web page where you can uh, generate code in the web page, but I can do it with a command line tool too. So I can do, uh, for instance, uh, I can type any expression. Actually, I think I'm going to skip this, but you can type any expression, you can decide the formats, and then it'll generate the code for you in like milliseconds. And our web page, you can, uh, you can do it in a a Java GUI interface where you choose the dimensions with drop boxes, and it's, it's kind of cute. But uh, it'll, I think it'll take too long to set up the internet connection. Do people so. use that for, for uh, generating code already, or is it just for demos? It's for demos, but it will generate a C library with that kernel for you. So you can use it for generating code and then copying it into your application. Mm -hmm. It generates a header file with, with the kernel. Yeah, 
Yeah. But we also have a C++ library that you can own on and just use like a linear algebra library. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a tensor algebra library, but it, you just use it by, you, we have overloaded the C++ uh, like parenthesis operator so that you can just define your expression and compute. So, so how does the expression get compiled in that case? Uh, so what we do right now is that we uh, take the expression, we run it through this thing, generate C code, yeah. store the C code, call the system compiler to compile the C so code as a, the fry, yeah. as a dynamic library, DL open that library. Okay. But we want to uh, write the uh, uh, LLVM backend, so you do that in memory. But it compiles it on the fly, yes. So it requires some compiler infrastructure at runtime. If you don't have a compiler infrastructure, if you're like a, a supercomputing node, then you can use the offline library to generate the kernels you need. Okay. Okay. I'll ask. I'll find. <laughs> sure. I'll go on to evaluation. So there's uh, there's two main stories in the result. The first is that uh, there's an infinite space of tensor algebra kernels. There's there's a lot of them, and uh, some of them, some points in this space have been hand optimized by someone somewhere. Others have not. Uh, but I'm going to show that for for the ones that have some sparse operands, <laughs> we're as fast as the one that has been hand optimized by someone. But we have the same performance for everything else. So wherever people haven't hand optimized it, you have two alternatives. You can use this, or you can use an alternative system that's much slower than us. Uh, there's a few general systems like the MATLAB Tensor Toolbox. Uh, or you can hand optimize it yourself and get the same performance as you would get from our system. Uh, the second thing is that, um, uh, the second story is that uh, there's no one size fit all format. Some formats are good for some matrices, and tensors and some formats are good for others. So you have to have a system that can give you many formats so that you can shape your format to your data. So let's look at the very simplest, one of the very simplest expressions. So the reason why I'm going to show results for a sparse matrix vector multiplication is that this is the kernel that people have spent most effort hand optimizing. So the imp implementations in, uh, in libraries like MKL is very fast. So in matrix vector multiplication, you have a sparse matrix. You multiply it by a dense vector. To produce a value in the output, you do a dot product of this sparse row with this dense vector. The results are here. This is TACO, uh, MKL, OSCE, which was written uh, for auto-tuning at Berkeley, Eigen, UBLAS, and uh, this thing, which is part of, I believe, uh, um, Boost. So these results show that we are comparable performance. Sometimes we're a bit slower. So this is a normalized time, so lower is better. Sometimes we're a bit slower than MKL, which is really a, a really good library. Sometimes we're a bit faster. So uh, it's, it's about the same. Well, what are those uh, on the, on the y-axis, the different inputs? The matrices from uh, the Florida, Florida sparse yeah. matrix collection. Again, I should have said that first. This is normalized just a reflection time. of the fact that I mean, there just isn't really that's right. I mean, there isn't a lot to do here in the sense of performance. I mean, it's not going to be fast because it's not random access. So really, what you're gaining is the fact that you can just handle anything. Yeah. And you have a nice, you know, regular format for what the output code looks like. Yeah, for, for this operation, that's exactly it. Uh, you write about 10 lines of code, and that's the best you can do, pretty much. So software prefetching is not buying you a lot. And if it was buying you a lot, then we could generate software prefetching, too. But it's not buying you a lot because you're bound, I think, on the length of the store buffer. Um, you do have random access into the vector, which means you don't have to emit merge code. So, so you're not getting that. Uh, what's the wrong? So, so, so in a case where MKL does do better, yeah. have you looked at see why, to see why? I mean, it's, it should be pretty easy to inspect the code, right? Yeah. Uh, well, we don't have the code for MKL. Oh, OK. So it's you, uh, proprietary. Okay? We think it's because these are small <laughs> matrices. So they fit in cache. Ah, okay. Uh, and then... Uh, and they do a better job dealing with that? Then? Apparently, yeah. And we do a better job when it doesn't fit in cache. Okay. But that is a hypothesis. I haven't okay. gone and verified that. So, I mean, uh, you don't really uh, examine a, a set of possible implementation choose the most optimal one, right? Yeah. So there any, right. There's no search through there's no alternative search. implementations. Uh, given given like one expression like this expression and one format for matrix, you have no choice. You have to follow the format in the direction the format goes. But when you have some of them are dense. Then you have more. Then you can tile the iteration space. We, we don't do that. We don't support that at the moment. So uh, we, have, we, we can't generate code like that. So if it's all dense operations, we are not the fastest one out there. Um, so, you can tile the data space, though. So if you do that, then you can get good performance with this. 
Sorry. Why are these libraries different? If there's only one way to implement these, so what is the, where is the difference coming from? They're not that different, though. This is almost within the noise. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Eigen is a little slower because they use uh, some abstractions like iterators and uh, template multi programming that might not produce the best code. Uh, so this is normalized time, so this is one, so maybe this is five, ten percent. Yeah. Uh, so is it yeah. within your measurement noise, or is it... It could be, yeah. Okay. I, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, it could be. So this is a particular sparse representation? Yeah, uh, this is so, XR. Yeah, okay. So it, depending on, the, on that, you could actually have quite different results too, right? In terms of right, right. I will show later what happens if you have different matrices. Do you have to choose different representations of the matrix? Okay. Like you can't use CSR for every matrix. Uh, some matrices you have to use a different format. And then you have to choose the right format. to, And that, the, the choice of the format will guide how the code looks. So then you will actually search different codes and you will find the best code. Okay, but we have a we emit parallel code too. And uh, when we emit parallel code, we're much faster than non-parallel ones, of course. Uh, Intel MKL also has parallel code, so we are, again, we're comparable. Now we're actually maybe a little faster. Shared memory. Three. Shared memory parallel, one single socket. Yeah. Because the way we initialize memory right now, we can't have multiple sockets because uh, the first touch policy, cache policy is, mm -hmm. uh, memory placement policy will kill us. But we, we'll, we can solve that easily, we just haven't done it. So it's shared memory. Yeah, multi-thread that. So the parallelism comes from if, if in a particular row, if there are three non-zero non indices, you can just look up the dense vector in parallel? Yeah, so the way we parallelize it, we parallelize the outer loop. This is CSR. So, um, oh, oh, okay. This goes on one thread. That goes on another thread. They gather from this vector in parallel. Each of these produce one output, so there's no interference output. This was a CSC format. You would have to synchronize on the output because you're scattering into the output. What, um, what if there is loading now? Like I have a lot more non-zeros in the first half than the second half. Yeah. Stuff like that become so yeah. there is no dynamic works. We can generate code that uses silk and then uh, <laughs> solve that problem with the runtime. <laughs> But uh, we don't do anything yeah. for that. Like most of the optimizations for SBMV has been focusing on how do you change the data so that the data access pattern is better. And you can do that with, uh, with this approach too. You just do that outside and then uh, when we get the data, we, uh, we access it in that order. Uh, that's sort of orthogonal to code generation. Uh, what is uh, the sparsity on those data sets and how does it compare with advanced performance? Right. Uh, so these are very sparse. I don't. I can't say all of them. I think most of them are um, are constant number of non-zeros on each row. So the more the matrix grows, the the lower the sparse the lower the sparsity gets. So um, uh, the sparsity grows O m, the size of the matrix grows on, on square. That's very common uh, because of locality in the world. I see. So do you have experience say that uh, if you have 90% of the sparsity, right. that uh, how do you compare with dense performance? Right. Um, I have to bring up our... So I did not put that in our talk. I should have had a backup slide on it. Forgive me that I am bringing up a paper here. But we have that graph. That's the cutoff point. So, I, I cannot uh, see it so clearly. Oh. Okay, so what this is saying is that for SPMV, sparse matrix vector multiplication, if 66% of your values are dense, uh, you're up, uh, the same. If, so if you have more than 35%, uh, 34% zeros, then uh, you, you're better off with a sparse, uh, sparse format. This is a surprising result. This does not match the result from the OSCE uh, PhD thesis, but this is what we have found, and we're pretty confident in that result. Yeah. That is good to know, because, well, at least on the domain we work on, usually we see about like 80, 90% of the sparsity is not super sparse, but uh, we hope to take advantage of. We think you can. Yeah, from that result, it looks yeah. like it's probably 
Yeah. Yeah. And probably that comes from the vectorization. Yeah. The, the, why that 35% makes sense? It could be, yeah. That vectorization matters less yeah. because the memory bandwidth right. is a bottleneck now. Right. That could be. Uh, okay, so let's look at, uh, I'm going to look at two more operations. This is another matrix operation. If you forgive me, I'll do another linear algebra one because this shows something very interesting. The next one will be a tensor one. This is sample dense dense matrix multiplication comes from data analytics. It's taken from... Uh, a PhD thesis at Berkeley. You element-wise multiply. This is you multiply two matrices, and then you element-wise multiply that with a sparse matrix. So you have a dense matrix. You multiply it by a dense matrix. That gives you 64 inner products. But you element-wise multiply it by a sparse matrix, which means that you only have to produce. Uh, uh, you only have to do this dot product wherever you have a non-zero here. So if I have a non-zero there, I have to do this dot product. But there's only 10 of these guys. I don't have to produce this dot product. So that brings me now to 10 in the product. So here you have to implement this whole thing in one kernel. If you implement these two binary kernels and compose them, you, you, you lose a lot of performance. So this shows that uh, this is like a general thing that happens outside of linear algebra too, where uh, uh, when you compose these high performance libraries, the first library might do work that the next library throws away. That's one problem. The next is you, if you compose libraries without sort of doing this kind of approach, uh, you, you lose temporal locality. And the third problem is that you might end up uh, emitting data from one library. Then you have to reorganize that data to go into the next library because it expects a different layout. So uh, they don't really compose. The problem here, I was talking to Madan and Todd and Said about it earlier, is that um, we are handwriting, we, we sort of uh, uh, handwriting these uh, specific routines that work on one layout. And then we're composing them with the, but by changing the data. But we think, we believe that uh, you need to shape the code to adapt to the data. You don't adapt the data to the code. You generate the code for the data you have. And then when you compose two libraries, you generate code to use that format. Next library generates code to, produce, to use the same format, so you get friction free. And this is another example of where you need that. So the performance here shows Eigen does this operation. They can do it in, in one go. So we have similar performance. Again, a little noise back and forth. Ublas does, do, do, does this as two binary operations, and then you just performance dies, and, which is expected. And this performance, this, this number of axes is going to go up the more the sparsity of B increases. So there's an asymptotic sort of difference depending on uh, uh, whether this is uh, on non-zero so, or, or, or on square non-zeros. Then you have MTTKRP, which comes from tensor factorization. In this operation, you have three index variables that index into a three tensor. You sum one of them with one matrix and the other one with another matrix. This is the main kernel in the canonical polyadic factorization for, uh, for tensors. Um, this is a sparse operation. You have to do it in one kernel, otherwise the temporaries will kill you. So you do this in one kernel, and we generate code to do that. And the MATLAB's tensor toolbox has a sort of an interpreter approach where they take the tensor, they transpose it so that it looks like a flattened matrix. Then they call matrix libraries, and then they transpose it back. So you sort of shape it to fit the routines they have available. But the performance is quite, uh, quite uh, lacking in this approach for this operation. But if you generate exactly the right code, you get good performance. And SPLAT is a recent work by Shaden Smith at the University of Minnesota. He hand-optimized this, uh, this kernel. Uh, and he gets excellent performance, better performance than us. Uh, we generate code that gets comparable performance to him, a little worse in most cases, a little better there. Um, we know what this difference is. And I'll mention it on my last slide, how we're going to fix this. So uh, what this shows is that you have, to, you have to generate code for this whole kernel in one go. Final, the final evaluation will show that different matrices matter for different, uh, different format matters for different matrices. So here you have a dense matrix. And here's the SPM V performance. So that's all the formats are row major. And this is the matrix vector multiplication. The dense format is the best format, of course, for a dense matrix. But if I change this to a thermal matrix, it looks like that. You want the dense sparse format, that's CSR. Because you have something on each row, but most rows don't have much values. So you want to compress the second dimension, but not both dimensions, then you're a little worse. 
if that's like a roll slice matrix, you slice dense matrix, you want the sparse dense format. And if it's a hypersparse matrix, which is starting to see in data analytics, you want the sparse sparse format. So there's no one size fits all. Different format matters for different matrices. You have to conform them to each other. And when you conform them to each other, you have to generate correct code. Finally, this is a blocked FEM matrix. So here you have three by three blocks because you're simulating in three dimensions with these kind of matrices. For us, this is a four tensor. So you can generate code for blocked linear algebra. This becomes a four tensor operation. This is SPMB, but expressed as blocked operation. And here, here, so here you're storing it with dense sparse, dense dense. That is the blocked compressed sparse row format. Uh, and, and that will be the best format. If you don't take advantage of the blocking, you lose a lot of performance because you don't get to vectorize those inner dense loops. So um, that is what I was going to talk about. Here's and then. So do you, uh, let's say when you have a very complicated tensor expression, do you have to introduce a transpose somewhere? Let's say one expression results in ijk and another expression results in ikj. Yeah, right? so you have to, yeah. transpose will show up as a cycle in the iteration graph, which we don't support. So you have to transpose it. it be, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so an expression with a transpose, you have to transpose before and then feed it into expression. Because a transpose, you, uh, you are um, uh, trying to access. So you're running over the format of the input, but you have to access the other one in reverse order. So you have to do random access, but this scans. So you're assuming that there's like a partial order of all the indices in your expression. Right. And do these kind of expressions show up in practice? Transpose expressions? Yeah. Absolutely. Like, uh, I showed some in the beginning with uh, Patsy, which do, did B transpose D. Okay. That expression we can do because you're multiplying it by a vector, so it's okay. You're not producing a sparse matrix. But if you're doing a single transpose to a sparse matrix, we, we have ha hand-coded it, but our theory cannot generate code for that. Uh, that's future work too. So that's, I didn't put it on here, but it's one of the future works. Uh, we want to uh, have portability, so we want to do GPUs. We looked at SuperTaco, which is a supercomputing version, many more formats. This gives us uh, the optimization that Shaden did with MTDKRP. This will also give us Gustafsson's matrix matrix multiplication algorithm for sparse matrices. That, I'm working on that now, and it's almost done. We want a scheduling language for the tiling. Uh, we want different summary rings, and you can do a lot of work on policy because we give you a code generating mechanism. Next question is, what code do you want to generate? So I think we've run. So how are we on time? We're, we are out of time, right? OK, then I will skip. Hmm? Can I have five moments? OK, I will skip. I was going to talk about the workspaces. I will skip it. Can I just ask a question about uh, acceleration? So there are these TPUs, and I know NVIDIA is also working on them. Maybe they already have hardware sports tensor operators at you know, the hardware level. Um, how do those affect this? I mean, you know, do, do you, does it sort of, a, there's another layer that compiles your output to that? Is that basically the way to think about it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So for the TPUs, uh, that would be a different backend for us. So we can compile to a TPU. Uh, the, the Google TPU looks like it's a um, fast matrix, matrix multiplication engine. So we would have to generate little matrix, matrix multiplications that that could use. Uh, for NVIDIA stuff, my, my group at MIT is uh, writing a grant with NVIDIA now to use this as the compiler for their custom TPUs, TPU units. But what we are trying to push is uh, the TPUs shouldn't be as hard-coded as Google's TPU. Because when you have something like this, you can generate a TPU that does certain operations like this mergers really fast, but that we can shape general code. We don't have to sort of fit the exact hard-coded thing they have. We want more programmable TPUs because then we can use this better. Yeah, so, so there is a direct relationship between the, the representation you have and the underlying hardware and support at some level, but you haven't explored that directly in your We haven't explored that directly, <coughs> that's right. But uh, they have to match uh, as well, otherwise you get friction. Yeah, so you have to shape right. everything to, to fit just like uh, a hand in a glove. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems, it seems like a natural um, direction to investigate, so, mm -hmm. certainly because at some point, these things are rolling out you know, hardware, and hardware is hard to change. Right? Right. So at some point, you, know, yeah, you want to get it right the first time. Yeah, I think that makes like, the case even more for a compiler, because you don't want to handwrite a code for all these kernels. And then, like I show you the exponential explosion, like yeah. different platforms is another axis of that explosion. Mm -hmm. So then a compiler would be more useful. But it's future work to actually do it.
Do these devices or even GPUs, do they help in a, with the sparse computation? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's been uh, much work from Michael Garland's group at NVIDIA showing that uh, a GPU is a quite, quite a good sparse matrix vector multiplication engine, and even a sparse matrix, matrix is because a GPU has more floating point operations, but it also has like 10 times the bandwidth. So you can load values uh, from memory really quick, and you can hide light, latency with their barreling and that barrel threading me mechanism. How, how sparse are the operations in typical machine learning applications, deep neural nets? Are those mainly dense? In the, uh, they're, 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 a lot of them are expressed as dense operations. But there's been work, especially for Bill Daly's group at Stanford, looking at uh, sparse neural networks. And uh, can you, so you have the, uh, typically uh, in a fully connected layer, you have a weight matrix. You, you want to multiply by like an input domain. Uh, and that ma ma weight matrix, during learning, you can knock out non-zeros. And it doesn't affect uh, accuracy that much. And then you create sparsity. So I, the way I th like to think about it is that if the neural network is a brain, it's a sparse system, you just don't know what it is. And you're trying to find that sparse system by sort of capping some uh, non-zeros to zero. But you have to artificially create it during learning in some sense. But a lot of the, the sparsity is actually dynamic. Like you do have a dense tensor, mm. but in practice, like around 50, 50 to sixty percent of them are likely to be zero. But you don't know which sixty percent of them are. So it changes. Yes, it changes. And so, would, would you be able to make use of that? Because you you have to convert that into a sparse representation. Yeah, that's a that's a really really good question. So what we're finding in our new work on format, this work which we are doing now with uh, PhDs in my group, is that. Uh, for a situation like that, packing it into something like CSR is too expensive. But coordinates uh, is sort of the natural format. You list up all the non-zeros. You don't have to pack with coordinates. So it's friction-free. So coordinates might uh, make the computation a little slower. But since you don't have any import cost, uh, the, you, you would be able to take advantage of things like that, depending on how sparse it is. But with this, since you have no like, friction in sort of packing it, you, uh, it doesn't really matter that they change. Okay. Something to add is that for training, definitely is dynamic. That there are different ways to get the sparsity out of it. But for inference, that uh, that part is static. Mm -hmm. okay, right? yeah. 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 You can explore sparsity. Mm -hmm. So maybe for inference, if it's static, you can use something like CSR that's more compressed. Exactly. And then for the other, you can use coordinates, which is. Uh, little less compressed because you don't compress the coordinates. Uh, you like the matrix is compressed, but the coordinate tree is not compressed. Uh, so you take a little bit of a hit, but you don't get the packing cost. Or, yeah. yeah, so the last thing I want to say is that all of this is available on GitHub uh, in our MIT license. You can use it as a library, or you can use this web interface that just lets you um, generate expressions. Thanks. Why yeah. are some rights reserved? What's the, what's the story with that? <laughs> Sorry? Why is it say some rights reserved? Uh, you have to give acknowledgement. That's the, what MIT oh, license that, that's, Oh, okay. That's the only that's part, that is the part only of the reserved okay. right. So it's a standard MIT license? It is a standard. That's just like the Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. This right. just says uh, you have to acknowledge us. Okay. That's, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's not a custom MIT license. Right, yeah, it's the yeah, standard okay. one. Yeah. yeah. So the web page, you can generate kernels and play with formats and all of that. Are you aware of companies that are using this? This thing? Yeah. So I've been talking to TileDB, which is um, a startup that, that uh, does uh, databases around sparse scientific data and uh, like uh, biogenetic data. Uh, and they're very interested in building the compute engine around this. And I'm talking to some people from the government who also want to use it for, for stuff. So and all the and all the code is in a, in, the, in the repo basically. You know, all Everything the except this JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you wanted this JavaScript, we could give it to you. <laughs> but it's not. Uh, it's <laughs> but this this just calls a server that compiles it, yeah. right? All everything is there. Yeah. Okay. We don't keep anything back. Um, yeah. How complex your kernel can be? Uh, as well complex. As, right. Sorry. Just the basic operator sort of to to few things into a kernel. Yeah. That's. That's like uh, uh, the answer is going to be a little two uh, part because you can have 
any size of the kernel, like any size. But if you have a lot of additions, the merge lattices will grow exponentially, uh, doubly exponentially, I believe, uh, which will, uh, if you're adding, say, two, uh, five sparse matrices, you'll have 100 megabytes of code. So uh, we give you the, you, we generate that happily for you, but you should not ask for it. <laughs> uh, we give you a lot of power, but power comes with responsibility. Yeah. So uh, very complicated merges of additions. They're, they're the ones to grow it up. Uh, you want to cut up the expression into multiple expressions. And, and one could think about uh, like a, a system written on top of that that does these policy decisions for you. That would be very interesting research. Um, for multiplications, mergers of multiplication, you don't get that problem. So if you have mixes of additions and multiplication, and multiplication will cut down the space of the merge lattices. What is the compilation time? Is it uh, milliseconds. Milliseconds. It's not okay, so like you can see yeah. it right here, right? Is that real time? Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> just, just goes like that. And that, that's going like to a server to call, call right. a, a command line tool. To, Got it. That's, that's the time it took me. Yeah. Well, of course, if you have like a really complicated addition and we produce 100 right. megabytes of code, it'll take a while to write Can that you code. You confuse, confuse it, like you know, just add a lot, multiply a lot. Of You'll crash it. <laughs> I'm sure you can crash it. <laughs> Maybe I do. Do you have it in a virtual machine? So I don't think we have an exploit right. here, but we'll see. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that compilation algorithm itself is linear in the uh, yep. size of the uh, uh, one of the graph that you had, yep. the iteration graph. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's linear in the size of the graph, but merge lattice, uh, like complicated merge lattices, will cause it to um, oh. <coughs> grow, grow out. So really complicated merge lattices will produce a lot of code. Mm -hmm. And it's l linear in the number of lattice points. Okay, okay, okay. Right. Uh, but it is a recursive algorithm, so if you have like a merge lattice at one point, it'll have to recurse down for each lattice point. Mm -hmm. okay. Because it's merging in this dimension, but then it has lots of subcases. But it's linear in that size, so the compilation time is not a problem. All right. Thank you. Thank you.